Today, we're gonna to talk about making checkpoint systems in Game Builder Garage. In general, it's not a whole lot of fun to replay the same bit of gameplay over and over and over and over again. And so checkpoints really help alleviate that so that every time the player makes a mistake for whatever reason, you don't have to redo a bunch of level that you've already seen before. You don't do the equivalent of tedious backtracking. Checkpoints help your player jump straight back into the action so they can play the next fun setup in your level and see what you have to offer. This also allows you to make a longer experience that does not feel tedious. Today, I'll be going over various different styles of setting up checkpoint systems, because usually you need to customize your checkpoint system to be the one that is the best possible one for your particular level and your needs. In order, today I'm gonna to talk about picking the right checkpoint for your level, then non-checkpoint setups, followed by multi-checkpoint setups without reset, then I'll talk about how the swap game node on works, followed by one checkpoint with a full reset of your level, and lastly, multiple checkpoints with a full reset of your level. In the sequel to this video, I'll show you how to store multiple bits of data, but we'll get to that later. So first let's talk about checkpoints in general. I'm gonna be showing you the idea and the methodology behind how you make a checkpoint system that's optimized for you. So the steps that I'm gonna show you are kind of optimized to be the most clear for demonstration purposes. So how do you design a checkpoint setup? There are two main things you need to consider when designing your own checkpoint system. Saving data and resetting the level. This may sound like you just do this without thinking when you set up a checkpoint system, but it's something that matters a lot. So what do I mean by saving and resetting? Well, usually when you go back to a checkpoint, it's because the player made some critical mistake. They fell off the level, they died to an enemy, they hit an obstacle, they ran out of hit points, whatever. And now they have to return to the checkpoint. The question is how much of the level should respawn? How much of it should get saved? For example, in this level, I want to collect three green stars. The question is, when I die, do I want the player to keep the green stars that they've collected, or do I not want them to keep the green stars? Some people might say, well, I wanna repeat the level exactly as it was right before the player died, but that might not be the best. Let's say the player kills a Goomba, the player unlocks a door, the player breaks open a passageway, they collect a power-up, they collect a star, they collect a coin. Do you want these things to come back? Do you want that door to already be unlocked when the player respawns? That's not a choice that I can make for you. That's your decision to make. I'll be going over this again when I compare different checkpoint systems in this video, but overall think about how much of the level gets reset versus how much information do you actually want to keep. That's enough theory. Let's first talk about the first checkpoint system, which is a non-checkpoint system. Let's say that I have an adventure level, one where you're platforming around an area and you're collecting various points of interest. It could be something like collecting red coins like in Super Mario 64, or collecting stars, or apples, whatever. Now for exploration-based levels, where there's a lot of points of interest that you have to individually go to, and again, we're in the Super Mario 64 style, where there's not really a forward or a backward to the level, it's just kind of like one big space that you get to explore. A traditional checkpoint of whenever you die, come back, is not necessarily the best method. For this style of level, you'll normally want to keep many of the points of interest still collected. And maybe there's a lot of points of interest. Maybe you've collected a lot of stars or a lot of coins or whatever. And whenever the player falls into a pit, you don't want them to have to start their entire search over again from scratch. In this sort of situation, my recommendation is a non-checkpoint system. This is one where the player character never actually dies. If you walk off a ledge, you fall off and you die, but instead of actually breaking the player character, you just respawn back at the start of level. So if you miss your jump for whatever reason, you just teleport away. This can come in many forms. For example, in this hand note on base level, if the ball touches the red blocks, instead of being destroyed, it will just teleport right back to the beginning of the room. The main advantage of this non-checkpoint setup is that all the data of your level is saved. All your doors are still open, your power is still collected, your points of interest are still collected, enemies that are dead stay dead. Everything is saved because you never ended the level. The main disadvantage is that you can no longer program certain types of obstacles or at least in the same way. In general, everything that's destroyed will never respawn. So you can't ever break your player character. The way to think about it is that destruction is forever. In this style, we are replacing setups that would kill the player. Like for example, if the player falls off the level, then kill them. We are replacing all of those with teleportation. Whenever you're setting up 
this sort of teleport based checkpoint system, there's a couple of ways to do this and you want to be as efficient as possible with teleporters. The first obvious way is that whenever you have an obstacle, make that obstacle not solid and then give it a teleporter. So the teleporter acts as a hitbox that will send the player back to the starting position. Additionally, we can set up a touch sensor around the player, which acts as a hitbox for him for whenever an alien touches him, then we activate this teleporter that's on the player to send him back. The third main method is to attach a location sensor to the player and then check whenever the player goes out of bounds, then activate a teleporter to send the player back. This can be very effective for programming death pits or going out of bounds. How do you choose which to use? Well, putting a teleporter on each individual object gets really expensive. If I have a lot of blocks with this, then that's gonna rack up node on limit and rack up clutter very fast. So the touch sensor method or location sensor method is definitely better than spanning a bunch of teleporters. However, if I have the same type of object with a different behavior, like the red block should kill the player, but he can stand on the white block just fine, then it's better to put those individual behaviors in with individual teleporters, because otherwise a touch sensor would go off on any sort of block. Next, we'll talk about linear checkpoint setups that use teleport without using a swap game node on. The way that it works and the way that you have to build around it is very similar to a non-checkpoint level, because every time you trigger a fail state, the idea is to teleport the player back instead of breaking the player character. In this particular level, we are scrolling the camera over to the next room every time we collect an apple. So here, we can only access and, and look at what's inside this room, and whenever we've completed the objective for that room, then the camera moves over. Because I'm using a hand note on, it's not like I'm moving a, a person between different rooms, and I only really can interact with a room once the camera is in position in order to actually play with it. In this way, I can have several rooms, even with their own fail states. And even when I screw up, I can make it so that the ball just teleports back to the start of the room and I don't lose all my progress. Another common setup is to use teleporters so that whenever the player collects a checkpoint, then you just change the ID of which teleporter you're gonna send the player to. And so here, whenever the player takes damage by touching this alien, then he gets set to whichever checkpoint is the relevant one. As a disclaimer, this is not my code, I'm gonna put it up in the video. The general premise behind this sort of system is that whenever the player activates a checkpoint, you are storing the information that that checkpoint has been touched in some sort of variable. That can be in a counter, it could be a series of flags, for example. Then, whenever you trigger the fail state, which is the player touching an enemy, in this case, you activate the relevant teleporter, which depends on, well, which is the teleporter that corresponds to the checkpoint that you used to be at. As an example, this user is using a 2D marker node on where the X axis of the 2D marker denotes the number of exactly which checkpoint you're currently on. And the Y axis is whether or not you've triggered the fail state. So when you are at checkpoint number two and then you die, this marker goes into this bullseye to activate this relevant teleporter. Again, since there's no actual resetting of the level, everything is saved. Enemies don't respawn, etc. This is the sort of setup that I would use if I wanted the entire level to stay exactly the same. Before going on, I'm gonna quickly define some terms. CP and then number means whatever checkpoint you're on. So this would be CP1, this is CP2, this is CP3, etc. At the very beginning of the level, which means that you have no checkpoint, is generally called CP0. This nomenclature is all inherited from Mario Maker. Whenever you design a multiple checkpoint system, it's very important that it has a couple of major properties. One is that you can't accidentally skip a checkpoint, get another one, and now you magically teleport to a checkpoint that you never got. This code, for example, has that shortcoming. Furthermore, it's very important that you're not able to accidentally CP1 yourself, which means that by collecting an old checkpoint, by coming back over here, I don't lose my progress. Going from CP2 to CP1 doesn't make it so that now I save being at CP1. So if I die after backtracking, I am sent to the farthest part of the level. This is called CP1ing yourself and is generally only really used to troll people. If you're building a troll level, more power to you. If you're not, it's just bad level design. There are two main ways to address this. 
One is to build the level so that you cannot get a later checkpoint before you get an earlier checkpoint. And the, the second way is to code. Specifically, you can only increment your checkpoint if you're going from one to two, to three, to four, etc. And I'll show you that in a later example. But in general, this system works just fine. All of the previous setups have been done with teleporters. These maintain the entire state of the level because the level never gets reset. But now we're going to introduce the swap game node on. Before I show you all the setups that retain some information, first I need to explain to you how the swap game node on works. What a swap game node on does is that as long as it has a zero passing into it, it won't do anything. The moment you pass a non-zero value into its port, then it will initiate a change of game. You have two major settings here. Keywords are unique strings that are tied to your specific game file. Game keyword is the string of characters that corresponds to the name of this file. And swap target keyword is the string of characters of where we want to go to next. So whenever swap game gets a number that's not zero into its port, we are going to start searching through every single game in your library for something that has this identifier inside of a swap game node on. When we find the game that has a string that matches the swap target string, then the swap game node on will not just bring us into that game, but the swap game node on in that game will start with an output. The output of the swap game node on is going to be whatever non-zero number we brought into it to begin with. The swap game node on's advantage is that we're totally restarting the level. Everything will respawn, etc. But we get to save progress in terms of checkpoints. In this tutorial and all these demos, the swap game node on will have the exact same game keyword as a swap target keyword. So we are basically swapping the game into itself. Using a swap game node on can be a little bit complicated because there's several parts of the device, but I'll try to break it down into a couple of major pieces that you'll always see with a swap game node on. In this little demonstration, here I start at CP0. If I die, then I will respawn at CP0. Now, if I grab the checkpoint and then I die, instead, I'll respawn at checkpoint one. So the question is exactly how does this work? Here I break down the four key parts of any swap game checkpointing system. I'll start from what happens when the game loads up. Swap game times on start gives us the value in the swap game node on only at the very start of the game. If swap game is one, which is that we've collected the checkpoint, then we're going to immediately activate this teleporter, which takes the player straight to checkpoint one. The second part is to keep the information that the checkpoint was acquired. And this can be either by actually activating the checkpoint so the player touches this checkpoint then it'll activate the flag. Or if we have a checkpoint in a previous life, then we will also funnel that to activate this flag over here. You can use a flag or a counter or whatever, but the point is that you need two parts. The part that updates when you grab the checkpoint and the part that saves your progress to keep what you had in a previous life. If the person dies, then we're gonna multiply that with the flag node on. If that flag node on has a value of one, then we're going to pass a one into swap game node on. So we'll restart the game with a value of one, meaning the checkpoint was indeed acquired. However, if the checkpoint has not been acquired, this is zero times one is zero, this does not get activated. So we need to build in a special separate case for what happens if we are at CP zero. So here, if we die and we're at CP zero, we have this longer timer to just retry the level. And when we retry the level, it'll just get us right back to where we were. So from the top, as a quick recap, if we had a checkpoint, respawn at the checkpoint. Keep the checkpoint data and update it if we do grab a checkpoint. If we die, restart the level with the same checkpoint information that we had before. Lastly, have a special case for CP0 because many nodons don't get activated when you pass a zero into them, including a swap game nodon. I'll be uploading the sample code so you can use it yourself. Again, this is not optimized for every possible situation. This is a very stripped down version of checkpoint system. Let's say that we want to extend this checkpoint system to not just one checkpoint, but multiple checkpoints. So here, for example, in this little rocket level, I have multiple checkpoints. So if I die at CP1, CP2, or CP3, I can just respawn right at the checkpoint. So here, for example, I can respawn right at CP2. This code works very similar to what we had before. The difference is that now we have a swap game that gives us multiple different numbers of checkpoints that we could potentially go to. In order to condense the case of CP0, in this data, 
I'm keeping 0 or 1, both mean CP0, 2 means CP1, 3 means CP2, etc. So let's see how this works out. When we load up the game, the swap game node on tells us what checkpoint we're at, but we have to take care of CP0. So this map has a subtraction by 1 with range restriction. This makes it so that the cases of CP0 both give me the same number. They both give me 0. Instead of having a flag that activates one teleporter, now I have a marker node on with multiple bullseyes. So depending on exactly what checkpoint we're supposed to be at, then activate the relevant teleporter to send the player to that checkpoint. Once again, this AND statement lets me cover the base case of CP0. This covers the first step, where we send the player to the right checkpoint when they respawn. Step number two is to save the checkpoint that we're currently on. This counter keeps that number. By routing the old value from the swap game node on into this counter, only at the start, we get to feed in the old value just to keep that running. Now, because we have multiple checkpoints, this step has one additional complication, which is that we don't want the player to accidentally grab an old checkpoint. I want to make sure that whenever you grab a checkpoint, you can only go forward and not backwards. If you design your level so you literally can't go backwards, this isn't a problem. Here, I'm going to show you the most robust way to make a checkpoint system that you literally cannot go backwards in. Whenever the player goes through a checkpoint, they activate this touch sensor. The touch sensor goes to this map node on. The map node on gives a value of 0.2 into this wormhole for checkpoint 1. For checkpoint 2, the map node on gives a value of 0.4. And for checkpoint 3, the map node on gives a value of 0.6. Right now, every checkpoint has an individual number marking that gives a different value at this wormhole. Now I'm gonna use this 2D marker node on to check if a valid new checkpoint has been acquired. In this marker node on, the X value corresponds to the checkpoint that we're currently on. And the Y value is the numerical code for the checkpoint that we have just touched. Now, whenever I grab checkpoint one and I have checkpoint zero, then the marker will go to this position because checkpoint one gives a value of 0.2. But when the marker moves to this exact position because we're at checkpoint zero, and we just touched checkpoint one, then this will activate the 2D marker node on in order to stimulate it to give plus one to the current checkpoint count. This records that a valid checkpoint was just touched. If I'm at checkpoint zero and somehow I were to grab checkpoint two or checkpoint three, the marker will be over here or over here, which is wrong. If we're at checkpoint one, then our new X value will be along this column. And if we currently have checkpoint one, the only way to increment the checkpoint counter is if we get the marker to exactly this position, which can only happen if the checkpoint value that comes in through the wormhole was 0.4. To match, I set the unique value of CP2 to 0.4. We can repeat this procedure for an arbitrary number of checkpoints or for even like a new game plus system like I have here. I just want to stress that this whole block of code, the only point is to check that a valid checkpoint was acquired. You can code this however you want in your game. You don't have to use this method, but however you code it up, I expect that it's not possible to accidentally lose progress by grabbing an old checkpoint or accidentally gain progress by touching the exact same checkpoint that I just got to again and skip part of your level. The last part of this code works very similar to before. If you die, this block of code gives your current checkpoint count times one, and that gets passed into the swap game node on. I can do this just because I've taken care of the CP0 case separately. Just to recap, load your old checkpoint data and send the player to that checkpoint with a teleporter. Then keep the running tally of the number of checkpoints. Update the number of checkpoints only when a new valid checkpoint has been touched. Lastly, when you die, send that checkpoint information into a swap game node on. That way we can repeat the whole cycle over again until the player actually beats your level. With this video, I hope I really opened your eyes to the different options you have available to you for making different sorts of checkpoint setups. You have non-checkpoint setups. You can use screen scroll, teleports, or swap game node on. With these tools, it's possible to make single checkpoints or multiple checkpoints. I really want to see you guys use this in your levels because Loop loves checkpoints. Stay tuned for part two, where I'll show you how to store multiple bits into a swap game node on to save a more complex state of your level. But until then, you can subscribe, check my stream, check my Discord, all the links down below, and I'll see you later. Bye.